search activities. First, welcome. Uh, good. <laughs> You're the name on some basic reference books in translation studies. Uh, translator, a uh, discourse in the translator, mm -hmm. and then uh, the translator as communicator, and then the books on dialogue interpreting. Which were edited volumes. Edited volumes, right. Can you say what are the main research lines in, yeah. in, those, in those works? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think I could pretend that it was a single research line right from the beginning, but there are common elements. And I guess you're asking me to simplify to the extreme because right. um, yeah. you need a, a relatively succinct reply. But I, I think probably the, the unifying strand is a concern to treat uh, the act of translating as an interactive phenomenon involving um, a source text as a relevant part of the process, which itself should be seen as an interactive phenomenon, i.e. involving production and reception, uh, and obviously the reception of target texts um, to be included in the whole thing. Now, when we started with discourse on the translator, we were entering a domain where in linguistics, uh, pragmatics was really only just beginning to make its mark in a big way and there had been a tendency to regard a text as a static entity which contained if you like all of the information that you might need to know in order to talk about the text the, the sacred source text absolutely yeah. yes yes and in translation studies uh, we were at that time of course in a domain where Scopos theory was, if you like, a relatively new idea, but was still largely only available in German. Mm -hmm. um, you, you read German? No, I don't. Neither does Basil. Ah. And some of the book reviews of Discourse and the Translator criticized us for not picking up uh, that work mm -hmm. in any substantial way, and it was purely a linguistic problem. On the other hand, I, I would have to say that in Discourse and the Translator, we were not aiming to review the field of translation studies as it then was. We were aiming to try and give some kind of integrated account from our perspective of the whole thing that was going on. Well, would you regard yourself as a theorist of equivalence, or is that a key term for you still? I, 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 think, I think it was at the, in those days, right. but uh, I've certainly uh, moved beyond that, right. and of course so has Basil under the influence of everything that's been said and done uh, uh, since then. And indeed, I think there are some lines in Discourse and the Translator where we point out that the term adequacy at the time was being seen as a substitute for equivalence. And mm -hmm. so even then we had some doubts about it, but when I look back at the text now, I notice how source text oriented we were mm -hmm. in sure. those days, and I don't feel that I'm like that now. Is dialogue interpreting responsible for a shift in your vision? Not entirely because, um, as I'll probably say later, we were very much, both of us were very much in, involved in teaching dialogue interpreting in those days. Okay. So we had a, you know, a close acquaintance with it. You, you mentioned Basil Hattin. Yes. We should explain that the first main books were co-written. They were. They were. Is it easy to tell which parts are Mason and which parts are right. You're asking me to reveal trade secrets now. No, no. <laughs> no but I'm going to tell you. I I'm think going to tell I can you. tell. Yes, yeah, uh, and other people have said to us that they think they can tell as well. But um, there's a difference between the two co-authored books. Uh, the first one was generated by the two of us uh, with a considerable effort, I have to say at the time, manage, managing to clear um, one morning a week. It was Friday mornings. Uh, and meeting together and simply co-writing. And oh, on each chapter. On each chapter, all the way through. Uh, in Discourse and the Translator, some chapters were first drafted by me. For example, the, the, the chapter on pragmatics was mm -hmm. first drafted by me. The chapter on register was first drafted by Basil. But then we went over those drafts together and rewrote them as a joint mm -hmm. effort. So. Um, I'm sure people can see the, the more Hatim influenced things and the more Mason influenced things. Um, that would be natural enough, but it was an exercise in co-writing from start to finish. Translator as communicator was quite different because Basil and I were not in the same location. 
at the time that that was written. He had a sabbatical year and he was in Jordan and I had a sabbatical term, a bit more than a term, two terms actually, mostly two, two terms, which I spent in Barcelona. And Translators Communicator came out of articles that he had published previously and that I had published previously that we didn't just put together and edit. We re rewrote them all from scratch, but each of us was responsible for our own chapters. So that was considered totally separate writing. Is, is it possible to say that the more descriptive passages are nascent and the more evaluative are printing, or is that wrong? Uh, I wouldn't have perceived it that way okay. at the time, but um, uh, if you're referring like to if you're referring to the 1997 book, perhaps yes. there is yes. a tendency like that. Yes. Yeah. Would you call yourself a linguist working on translation or a translation scholar? Um, I'd call myself both. Okay. That's okay. Not and I, I'm not sitting on the fence there. The, the point is that. Um, you know, I've been working in translator training and as a translator and occasionally as an interpreter for the last 35 years and you know that is the stuff of my business all right? at the same time I came into translation studies via linguistics and I have always found and I still find the methodological tools of linguistics widely conceived not narrowly conceived, that's important I still find those the most useful and practical for my terms. Your work now is, is more pragmatics than text yeah. linguistics, as I understand. Uh, yes, indeed, although, true. you know, if you look at Bograd and Dressler as the first major statement in English on text linguistics, you will find that pragmatics features there okay. quite, you know, prominently. So I wouldn't make a rigid distinction, but it is true that um, text linguistics now feels a little bit dated. Mm -hmm in its concentration on the text as an entity in itself. How about yeah? the distinction between a text linguistics and discourse analysis? Uh, is this is viable? fraught. This is fraught because people have used the terms interchangeably and, for example, using discourse analysis to talk about speech and text analysis to talk about writing, which is not helpful at mm, all. Yes. Uh, so, um, if anything, I would say that, that discourse analysis is having a longer life and with recent developments is, has first of all become very socially conscious with Fairclough's work on critical discourse mm -hmm. analysis, but now with critiques of that approach uh, from people like Michael Stubbs and Henry Widdowson and others, um, we, we are bringing pragmatics much more to the fore in discourse analysis. Well, where do you stand in that debate? Right. My heart is with critical discourse analysts, right? Um, and I would like it, I would like those people to be able to demonstrate the things that they are trying to demonstrate, but there are huge methodological problems which have to do with the fact that they still present the analysts' intuitions as if they were facts about um, the production and reception of texts. And there's demonstrably a leap there that is unwarranted. And we have huge problems in this whole area of discourse analysis in being able to say anything objective, but objective is a big word, about what happens beyond what is said or what right. is written. Yes, this is the area where we're in, yes. going beyond what is said and what is written, but to be able to make any confident statements is very difficult. Okay. Can we go back to when you're, say, about 22? That's uh, a long time. You, you work in Scotland. You work in Edinburgh. Yes. Very yes. Mason yes. is not a Scottish name, or is it? Uh, no, it's not. My parents Edinburgh. were English. Right. I was born in Dunfermline, in Fife, uh, oh, because, so. because my father was there during the war, mm -hmm. okay, and he worked in Rosyth Dockyard. Uh, so, at at the age of about three or four, my parents came down to the south of England and I did all my schooling in England. And I didn't return to Scotland until I was successful in getting a job at Harriet Watt University in 1971. All right, okay. okay. So you're 22, where are you? 
Uh, when I was 22, uh, I think I was in France. Mm -hmm. um, I had embarked on a doctorate in Romance linguistics. Mm -hmm. But French is your first foreign language? My first foreign language. I had uh, Spanish as a subsidiary language, as it was called, at university. Um, I embarked on this doctorate, which was full-time for the first three years. I hadn't finished at the end of three years. I was looking for jobs, and I applied for several, but amongst them, one was an announcement of a post at Harriet Watt University where they had just launched an undergraduate degree in translation and interpreting. So this was your first job? This was my, well, my first permanent job. I, right. I had jobs in universities in France. Right. Okay. Well, right. One year thing was that kind okay. of thing. Okay, so just... And then you stayed. I, I didn't intend to. Right. I certainly didn't intend to. I, I saw it as a, a, a stepping stone, to be honest. But mm -hmm. the thing is that in those days, very few other places had anything to do with translating and interpreting. And although it was new to me, I found it fascinating. I got involved in the practice of it. I got involved in uh, conference interpreting. Have, have you worked? Yes, I, uh, so in those days, yeah, um, because we had got into that area, the university was bombarded with uh, requests to provide conference interpreters for conferences mm -hmm. that were happening in Scotland. And um, uh, we um, serviced those conferences, very often by putting it out to freelance conference interpreters who were available. But um, we, we did a lot of it ourselves. Um, about a decade later, I gave it up because I much preferred written translating to conference interpreting. I didn't find conference yeah. interpreting satisfying as an activity. A lot of people really? did, but I didn't, yeah, yeah. Okay. Translation studies has been described as a success story, mm. really of the 1990s. Yes. But you've been doing it through the 70s and 80s. Yes, yeah, yeah. Is, is that a fair characterization that somehow it took off in the 1990s? Well, you know, if you look at the number of volumes published, if you look at the number of courses being set up, you would have to say that that is true. You would have to say that there's no, um, there's no doubt about it, that the subject as a subject area took off in the 1990s. But in terms of theoretical and practical advances within the discipline, I would say it's been a continuum mm -hmm. from uh, already, you know, I have to say it, we, we are quick to condemn Catford and NIDA and all of these people. They were pioneers. Yeah, yeah, they were, they were, pioneers. They were re remarkable people, and their writings were remarkable. And, and very rich. In yes, indeed, right. indeed. And, and I think it's been step by step uh, all the way since then until now. Which way do you think translation studies is heading in? Um, I think it's heading in a very postmodern direction at the okay. moment. What does that mean for you? Um, I think it means relativizing everything. It means a return towards literary translation as being the primary material of the discipline. I, is that good this is a personal view, bad? right? Well, um, it's not necessarily bad, but if I can be polemical mm -hmm. uh, for a moment, I, the one problem I have is with at works which self-evidently apply mostly to literary translating and are speaking about literary translation, but purport to speak for translation as a whole, mm -hmm. when in fact literary translation is a small part of the market. Well, what about dialogue interpreting, or community interpreting, yes. as it's sometimes called? Yeah. Uh, surely that's been a success story in terms of research? Yeah, I think, I think it has, although this is, of course, relatively new. Yes, right. I, no, no, I think it, it, it has been. Um, and it is having a knockback effect, and this is very interesting. The, the new concepts and ideas that are coming in through research into face-to-face -face interpreting um, is having a big effect on research and conference interpreting with works like Ebru Dirica and other right, people right. now who are beginning to reevaluate conference interpreting no longer just in terms of, you know, the psychology of the brain or, or, or the, you know, the workings of the brain and so on uh, and what happens in the booth right. towards the whole context right. in which the thing takes place. Yeah. Okay. Uh, final question. You know, as you know, that I'm aware, uh, uh, the translation studies research community is, is in many ways divided about the question of boycotting Israel. Yes. 
And uh, I hope this is a transitory phenomenon, but do you have a particular position with respect Yeah, to I do. It hasn't changed. Um, and of course, there are two major events that um, are sort of milestones in this. Ob obviously, the stance taken by St. Jerome Publishing mm -hmm. in the mid to late 1990s. And just this year, in my own country, and the decision by the, the main university teachers union, the AUT, to boycott Israeli institutions, mm -hmm. which is hugely controversial. Um, my view stems from the, the position that I took back in the 1970s and 80s about South Africa, which was that I wasn't going to boycott individual academics from those countries. I used to, when I was head of languages at Harriet Work, get regular phone calls or, or, or letters from uh, South African universities exploring collaboration, visits and so on, and I would write back to them and say, I'm very, very happy to welcome you as a visitor. I cannot sign an exchange, or I personally am not prepared to sign an exchange agreement with your university. And when we were suddenly confronted with this thing in the translator, and I have to say, I was suddenly confronted with it. The first I saw of it was Franz Perschaffer's letter. Um, uh, I, I simply went back to that position and said that that was the, the position I, I took, and I've tried to maintain that. On the other hand, and I, I want to say this before your tape runs out and before you, you, you shut me off, I feel, I do feel, and I'm prepared to go on record on this, that something has to be done uh, about Israel because I do not think we can stand by and see what's going on in Palestine uh, and just pretend that it is of no concern to us. And I have a problem there because, I, I, again, I say I have done nothing, right? I have done nothing positive in this respect, save perhaps sign a few petitions and maybe put money in a few collecting boxes. It's nothing. And I feel something should be done. I feel we should stand up and be counted. Um, but I stop short of seeking to boycott Israeli colleagues and uh, okay. academics. Can come with me to Al Quds University if you like. Well, that, are, are you going? <laughs> yes, I go every year. Right, right. Okay, that's yeah. good for the for the day. Uh, I know. I thank you. Okay, thanks very much. We'll talk about Al Quds off the. <laughs> um, it's Juliana House's husband who.